we will open with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you are gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Father, in our hearts, we want to be like you and we know that we're far from the ideal, but we want to see Jesus. We want to eat the little book that he um, is absorbed into every part of our being. We pray that we would understand this book, that it would give us life and purpose and that you would prepare us for the work that you've designed your people to do. So, Lord, we ask for the Holy Spirit to be poured upon us. We open our mouths wide to receive him. May he do everything that you've um, appointed him to do for us this morning. We pray for those still coming. Uh, We pray for those who will be watching on um, the internet that these things may grant clarity and uh, that you would... uh, Clear my mind, Lord, to to, to be able to speak what is needed and to to leave things out that will only muddy. So we thank you, Father, for the wonderful light you've shown on our paths, the privilege it is to see it. May we um, give ourselves to it wholeheartedly, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things you have to do when you start sharing the prophetic message with other Adventists is to convince them of the importance of the book of Daniel. It, um, you know, a mighty angel comes down in Revelation 10 who we're told is no less a personage than Jesus Christ and he commands those people, the Millerites, to eat that book. And as far as I can find, there's no other place in scripture where he comes back down and tells us to stop eating. The book of Daniel should be our breakfast, lunch and dinner. Breakfast and lunch. (laughs) Uh, It it, it just should be our our, our textbook. Um, And so we we turned there yesterday to take a closer look at it. And the reason we did was because of the quote we read. And we just might just review that before we start. Testimonies, volume 5. Page 716, the top of your notes. Five T seven one six point two. The heading is timelines. While the Protestant world is by her attitude making concessions to Rome, let us arouse to comprehend the situation and view the contest before us in its true bearing. Let the watchmen now lift up their voice and give the message which is present truth for this time. Let us show the people where we are in prophetic history and seek to arouse the spirit of true Protestantism, awaking the world to a sense of the value of the privileges of religious liberty so long enjoyed. Why did we go to the book of Daniel after reading that quote? What do we... What, what is our calling? What do we have to do? To show the people where we are in prophetic history. And one of the clearest places to see that is in the book of Daniel. When we, we line out, the, especially the, um, the prophetic uh, narrative we get through understanding Daniel chapter 2, it gives us a panorama of prophetic history. And uh, we should be able to show people where, where we are. And, and it, it's relatively easy with that. We just point to the bottom, don't we? <laughs> we point to the feet. But we also understand that as we get closer to the very end of that body, the more detail we're going to see. And so God gives us more information on that basic image of Daniel 2 so that we can get more precise in showing people where we are in prophetic history. Because... It's very simple, but it's very, very profound, Daniel 2, but it's hard to get a real precise uh, point of where we are in in history from it. So we have to add to it. 
We add to it from Daniel 7, 8 and 11 and then we also go to the book of Revelation because Daniel and Revelation are the same book. So think of Daniel as the skeleton and, uh, you know, this is, this is like the skeleton and this is like the, um, the lymph system and uh, the um, circulatory system. You know, the, the, the systems that run through a body, this is the body. These are those circulatory systems that run through a body. But then we also have vital organs and we can get that from the book of Revelation. So they, they go together to one make, make one body of prophetic truth. The first word in that um, quote is very interesting. It says, while the Protestant world is by her attitude making concessions to Rome. So we looked at that word attitude. We saw that it was the way you sat for having a portrait done or having a, 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 a statue made of you. You presumed a certain attitude. So an image was being made of you. And here we've got the Protestant world is making an image to Rome. And the first word is while. What does the word while mean? What, does it, what, what idea do you get from the word while? It's process, isn't it? Well, in, the, in, the, in Sister White's writings, you see a lot of when, thens. When you see this, then that happens. And when is like a point in time. But while is like a period of time. So while Protestantism is doing this, so over a process of time, then this should do what for us? Arouse us, wake us up to view the contest. There's war going on. And, to before, and the contest before us in its true bearings, just how um, vital this this uh, viewing this warfare is it it's the the message that we give the message that we lift up our voice to give it's the present truth for this time to show people where they are in prophetic history but also it arouses in them the spirit of true protestantism so within this um, quote we've got a difference between false protestantism and true protestantism and so that's what we're um, trying to um, flesh out, I guess, eventually from, from the book of Daniel. So we went back to Daniel and we got that panorama of history that's giving us in Daniel chapter 2. And I did a bit of a messy job yesterday, so I've just tried to um, write it a bit clearer on the board. And some of you have been given sheets of paper that just, you write it out in your own words. It's like drawing the lines. You should always draw the lines yourself, draw them how they make sense to you. Draw out these uh, prophecies, how they make sense to you. Uh, so that you become more familiar with it. And, and what I've found is um, when, you, when you do interact with people of the church, I, I've just been absolutely amazed on how little they actually know. You know, if you'd say what's in Daniel 6, they're like, got no idea. We should be able to say Daniel 6, Daniel 6 is what? Uh, Lion's Den. Okay. Revelation 16. Plagues, right? Just get familiar. Uh, Daniel nine, prayer. Yeah. Revelation five, heavenly, heavenly scene. You know, just get, get a textbook. Just put chapter title up the top, and put underneath each chapter title what you find. It doesn't matter if you understand it. Just know what's in each chapter. Get familiar with it. What people do is they get bogged down on the detail. I can't understand all this. Stand back and see the big picture and then fill in the detail. But it's hard to teach people the, the intricacies of present truth when they don't even have a basic knowledge of Daniel. So we've got four, we've got really four main prophecies of Daniel, but there's four stories of Daniel. I think Brother James is going to um, talk about them. So you can really pull Daniel apart and, and see it in a very simple, simple way. So, so we did that. We looked at that each chapter, that each prophetic chapter is written according to a theme. Uh, Sister Tess and Elder Parminder, they don't use the word theme. What is the word that they've been using? Threads. Truth should be threaded together. And so each of these, they're just not random, you know, um, left field uh, 
uh, uh, prophecies, they, they're actually threaded together. And the, the theme or the thread of Daniel 2 was king and a kingdom because when we looked at Babylon, we saw that um, Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, you are, thou art the head of gold. But after thee shall arise another kingdom. So each section represented a king plus a kingdom. You have to see that together. We went to, um, uh, and we saw that it decreased in value, increased in strength. And when we got down to Rome, we see Rome in three parts because we've got, the iron goes right through to the end, but we've got iron legs, iron and clay feet, and then at the very end of the body is iron and clay and toes. So you can actually divide Rome into three, which we said was pagan Rome, papal Rome before the deadly wound, pa resurrected papal Rome after the deadly wound or modern Rome. We go on to Daniel 7, same kingdoms but represented as wild animals, winds striving on, on, on a sea, the sea of humanity and out of that, that warfare comes up these wild, untamable animals, the lion, the bear, the leopard and the nondescript beast and getting increasingly ferocious. We're told that this iron breaks, breaks, breaks God's people, whereas this beast breaks, devours, stamps God's people. And it does that through, what were the two things we saw in verse 25 of Daniel 7? How it breaks God's people. It devours the saints and it changes times and laws. So it's not only how it physically interacts with God's people, but also how it interacts on a more, um, I guess, a doctrinal level. So then we go on to Daniel 8 and it will expand on that because on Daniel 8, what kind of animals did we see? Sacrificial animals, but not quite right sacrificial animals. Uh, animals with blemish because ram that had broken horns or one horn, sorry, higher than another, he goat with a horn between its eyes, so it was definitely um, not right and then it broke and then we knew that they, they, these, these represent counterfeit sanctuary. The, the, sa Satan's religion is just a counterfeit of God's religion and what were the, how, what, what did the, people do with their sacrificial animals. They brought them into the sanctuary and they tied them to the horns of the altar and the life of the animal was transferred to the sanctuary through the blood, through, through their life. And so Daniel 8 represents religion or the philosophy and ideology of these kingdoms. And what, were, in essence, did we learn from Daniel 8 was their philosophy? The ram waxed. He goat, little horn, exceeding great. And then we see that even that the little horn paganism waxes exceedingly great. The little horn papalism, uh, uh, it, 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 it go, it, I said, and, and it waxes great, which is even more than exceeding great. <laughs> it's, it, it's, 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 it's as great as you can get. And that word great is the word. Do you remember the Hebrew word? Gadal, the spirit of self-exaltation that started in heaven, was brought to earth, was given to Eve, you shall be like God, and passed on to Cain and has been developed into kingdoms over time. So you not only just have individuals and then families under Cain, but then it will develop into whole kingdoms. But that is the religion of paganism. Then we went to uh, Daniel chapter 11. And Daniel 11 is the story of the king of the north versus the king of the south. And Gabriel told Daniel that I'm going to show you what's going to happen to your people in the latter days. What happens to God's people in the latter days? The king of the north is what happens to them. We, we looked at Jeremiah chapter 1. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 25. Because God said, I'm going to send who? All the families of the king of the north. 
So not only the Babylonian family, but the Medo-Persia family, the Greece family, and the Rome family. He's going to send all the families of the king of the north. But if you go to Dan uh, Isaiah, uh, what did I say? Jeremiah 25. And we might look at this a little slowly, actually. We, um, we'll start in verse 1, Jeremiah chapter 25. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. That was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. The which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is the three and twentieth year, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. So God has sent me to you and I've got up early every day and I've given you a message and you have not, you have not listened. Hearkened is more than listen. Hearken is listening and then acting on. So if you hearken to something, you actually take it on board and it produces a result. Verse 4, and the Lord hath sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. But ye have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. So not just me, I've sent lots of other servants that have got up early, given you a message and you have paid no attention. Verse 5, they said, turn ye again now every one from his evil way and from the evil of your doings and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them. And provoke me not in your anger with the works of your hands and I will do you no hurt. What did we read from Jeremiah chapter 1 that the people of God were doing? They were making idols and they were worshipping the works of their own hands. So what, are they, what is the role of the prophet? To tell them to stop doing it, <laughs> to warn them. And verse 7 says, Ye have not hearkened. So three times you didn't listen. You didn't listen, you didn't listen. Verse 8, Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who's, king of, who's Nebuchadnezzar? And who's the king of Babylon? My servant. And will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and perpetual desolation. So I'm sending, the king of Babylon is my servant, and I'm not only sending him against you, who else is he sending him against? All the nations. So first God's people, and then everybody else. So um, king of Babylon is who? And he is God's servant. But he doesn't stay God's servant. He gets tested. He has 70 years of probationary time. If we keep reading. So, so God's people go into captivity for 70 years. We understand that. But then it says... Um, I will keep reading. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So 70 years captivity to God's people. Verse 12. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish who? The king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolation. So Babylon gets, uh, sorry, God's people get 70 years captivity but then Babylon also gets, that allows Babylon to have 70 years of probationary time because now Babylon is in close association with God's people. If God's people didn't go into captivity, would Nebuchadnezzar have ever met Daniel? So in God's providential care of the nations, he brought them close together. It was punishment, but it also provided Babylon with that opportunity to hear the message that they weren't going to hear. So we need to bring that down into an end time scenario. Why is the king of the north coming at the end of the time, at the end of the world? Perhaps we're not given the message that we need to be giving. So 
we get punished because of the king of the north, but it also brings about the circumstances that take the message to the king of the north and gives them probationary time. God is very, very fair. So, just in Daniel 8, we saw that Babylon wasn't mentioned um, uh, emphatically in Daniel 8, but we put down that he is the ox anyway. Where did we get the ox idea from? Why do we say Babylon is the, the sacrificial animal for the ox? Daniel chapter? Daniel chapter 4. Okay, because did he have Gadal? Did he have self-exaltation? Yeah. Look at this great city that I built all on my own. Uh, no, you didn't. God gave it to you. So he um, and he didn't. He didn't. He was told to look after the poor. He was told to be a good king. Uh, he didn't do that. He put his money and his wealth into his city, into his kingdom, and in the end, he ended up um, turning into an ox and eating grass for seven years. Uh, so he was a not quite right sacrificial animal. So another one reason. Not the main reason, but he, he, you can include him in Daniel chapter 8. But in Daniel chapter 11, Daniel chapter 11 doesn't start with Babylon either, does it? Babylon, the kingdom is finished. But we do understand from Jeremiah and other passages that he is the original king of the, uh, the, the, king of the north there as well. So we put him there in inverted commas because it, it's what gives them, their, that's their purpose, their job function. Uh, then we, we saw, just as in Daniel chapter 2, that Rome came in three phases. The story of Daniel chapter 11 gives us the history of those three phases of Rome. Pagan Rome has to conquer three geographical areas, conquers its enemy. Its enemy is the king of the north, wipes him off so he can become the king of the north. Then how did he conquer the king of the north? He'd made an ally. So next he's got to conquer his ally and then he can conquer Egypt. Then he rules for a time and then he falls. Papal Rome, three geographical areas had to be plucked up. Uh, then he ruled for a time, times and a half a time before he falls at the infliction of the deadly wound. Modern Rome has to conquer three geographical areas. This is the resurrection of Papal Rome. So sometimes we say that it's two phases and that second phase it has a death and a resurrection. It depends on really what thread of prophecy you're talking about. But for, this, for the purpose of this um, study, we'll just say this is the third phase um, he has to conquer the king of the south. We know that we're still in that warfare now. That battle is still going on. Then he will conquer the glorious land, which is verse 41 of Daniel 11. He'll conquer Egypt. And then he'll rule the world for a short space. And then he will fall. So based on how Babylon... God illustrates the end from the beginning. So if this image begins with Babylon, what's it going to end with? Babylon. So this is... Babylon, literal, historical Babylon, and this is spiritual mystery Babylon. And we looked yesterday and saw that Babylon is divided into three parts, dragon, a beast, and a false prophet. And this is what we see in the iron and the clay and the toes, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And, of course, the purpose of our study is we really want to understand that false prophet um, because it's the false prophet that will deceive us. Uh, so we might look at that um, a bit more closely later, but for, the, for, for now. Um, so have you, where have you seen the prophecies of Daniel li laid out like this before, line upon line? Have you seen this before? Daniel 2, 7, 8, anybody seen this before? Where have you seen it before, Brother Dougie? Uh, yes. Come on. I'm going to show you where you've seen it before. What's this? What's this? What's this? Seven. What's this? And what did they put up the top of Daniel chapter 8? Which is our uh, ox. Right? It's right there. This is nothing new. This is, this is our chart that we know really, really well. Huh? 
it's all here. Then we've got dates. Then we've got what? Revelation what? Me? He? Sorry? Keep going. <laughs> You'll get it eventually. Revelation 12. Revelation 12. First beast of Revelation 12. Now what have we got? What's this one? You can't see the fine print. <laughs> This is Revelation 13, verse 1. So this is uh, Revelation 12, 3 and 4, the dragon. This is Revelation 13, the first beast. And down here, you probably, can you see it with the pulpit there? Revelation 17. So Daniel 2, 7, 8, Revelation 12, 13, 17. And they're threads. They're brought together. What's the thread that brings all these prophecies together? What ties Daniel and Revelation together? Just look at your chart and have a swing at the bat. And what's the time? What's that? 2520. 2520 is what ties these prophecies together. We're going to have a look at that. We'll go on to have a look at that. But it's a good idea to have a good idea. You know, these, these charts weren't just like thrown, you know, throw a whole, whole, whole heap of symbols on a chart. Um, here, look, the 1850 chart. Daniel 2, 7, 7, 8. And then, and of course, we've got Revelation 9. Because we're over here. What causes about the fall of Daniel? Oh, sorry, of pagan Rome. Our trumpet powers of Revelation eight, and here we've got Revelation eleven. The trumpet is the tr trumpet as well. So, what's going to bring about the fall? Trumpet. So, um, Revelation fills fills in the gaps. Okay. So, one of the things we started yesterday was from First Corinthians chapter fourteen. Um, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So God is the author or builder of Jerusalem. Satan is the author or builder of Babylon. And um, so we compared Jerusalem with Babylon. We saw that they were polar opposites. So how would we just, just describe this in a word? We would call this Babylon, Satan's kingdom. Is this Satan's kingdom? And we had a quick discussion yesterday as well because if this is Satan's kingdom and this is king of the north, king of the north, king of the north, king of the north, where's the king of the south? Not there. Not part of Satan's kingdom. Uh, Islam, not there. Not a part of Satan's kingdom. We need to understand... What, what, what was that quote we read? Um, uh, we need to view the contest before us in its true bearings because... What do a lot of Americans and or, or even Adventists uh, uh, believe that our great enemy is? Islam. Islam's not our enemy. Their hands against every man, and every man's hand against him. But Islam has um, been a help for God's people over the centuries. Uh, the King of the South, as wicked and as horrible and as dis despotic as that nation has been. Uh, they're putting a restraint on the king of the north. And while the king of the north is being restrained back here, what's he not doing? Conquering the glorious land. <laughs> so they're performing their purpose. They're not, um, they're not working for God. They're not working for Satan. But God is using them to distract us, to, to, to distract the king of the north. Once they're conquered, then it's a slippery slope for us all. So... So uh, th we could just call this Satan's kingdom. God's spending a lot of time trying to lay out what our enemy looks like, how it behaves, why it behaves the way it does, the philosophy and ideology behind it, and then what its purpose is. Oh, so where do we see God's kingdom? Babylon, we should see Jerusalem. So go back to Daniel chapter 2.
Daniel 2, and we will read 34, 35, 44, 45. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, and the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away. And then if you go over to verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to another people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. So we have the explanation of what uh, the king saw in vision of the stone, and then we have Daniel's interpretation of the stone. So what did Nebuchadnezzar see? He saw a stone that was cut out. Cut out of what? There's a mountain. So we see that there's a mountain. And out of that mountain is cut out a stone. And what does the stone do? Okay, now I, I want you to just think, don't think too hard. <laughs> Do, what is the stone doing to the image? What's happening to the image? It's getting... Uh, you're all right, but I'm looking for a particular word. Okay, take your back, yourselves back to the time of Christ. You've been caught in adultery. What are they going to do to you? What's happening to the image? It's getting stoned. Who gets stoned in the Bible? Why does Stephen... Everybody always says Stephen first. Always. Why did Stephen get stoned? And what do you, what do you call that? If you commit blasphemy, don't you get stoned? He was stoned because of blasphemy. Why else do you get stoned in the Bible? Adultery, you get stoned? Yeah, almost, yes. Rebellion, yes. Man picked up sticks on the Sabbath. You got stoned. So um, why do you get stoned? Go back to Sister uh, Rachel's study yesterday. She talked about the keeping of the covenant. So if you broke the law, you got stoned. So why does this image get stoned? Blasphemy. All of the above. Sabbath breaking, fornication, Jezebel sleeping with Ahab. Okay, so lawbreakers get stoned. So that gives us, um, and essentially we, we, we would understand anyway that if you practiced a pagan religion, you weren't keeping the commandments of God anyway. But um, this is why this image gets stoned. So, um, what does that tell us? We, that tells us a lot about the image or the kingdoms. But what does that also tell us about the stone? Go to John chapter 8, verse 7. John 8, 7. John 8, 7 says, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And this is the story you were referring to, the woman caught in adultery. She was to be stoned. And what was, did Jesus tell the, uh, tell the people? Who could, who could stone her? So what does that tell us about the stone? The sinless, the sinless kingdom. 
So let's go with this. We're going to compare and contrast Satan's kingdom with God's kingdom. God's kingdom is the stone. And it must be without sin. Okay. Now, Daniel is um, based on the principle of repeat and enlarge. What is the repeat and enlarge of the stone kingdom that we're going to find in Daniel chapter 7? Open book quiz, go to Daniel chapter 7. It's going to tell us something more about this stone kingdom. Daniel chapter 7. What is it in Daniel chapter 7 that's going to give us more understanding about the stone kingdom? You tell me which verse. 26. Yes, what does 26 tell us? So 26 is an interpretation of, of what he saw in what verses? I would even start earlier than that. Verse 9, what happens in verse 9? Daniel 7, verse 9 onwards is, gives us what information? We're Adventists. This is our bread and butter. The, the, the investigative judgment, the opening of the judgment. So what do we know about the investigative judgment? That there are books in heaven and everything we've ever said or done or thought or would have done if we had had the opportunity is all written down in books of heaven. I don't know how that makes you feel, but it makes me feel a bit uncomfortable <laughs> because we've got to belong to this kingdom, don't we? This kingdom is without sin and there is records in heaven of everything. Uh, I read a, a, um, from a Bible Commentary, Volume 5, 1085.4. Beast 5 BC, 1085.4. God's law reaches the feelings and motives as well as the outward acts. It reveals the secrets of the heart, flashing light upon things before buried in darkness. God knows every thought, every purpose, every plan, every motive. The books of heaven record the sins that would have been committed had there been opportunity. God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. By his law he measures the character of every man. As the artist transfers to the canvas the features of the face, so the features of each individual character are transferred to the books of heaven. God has a perfect photograph of every man's character and this photograph he compares with his law. He reveals to man the defects that mar his life and calls upon him to repent and turn from sin. Everything is recorded and that's what that um, investigative judgment, the... the, the uh, it re reveals to us there is a time when God sits and the books are open and everything is there on record and yet he tells us this is the kingdom that I am calling you to belong to. So if we stopped at Daniel 7, I think for most of us uh, we're in a pretty hopeless case. So where do we go? We go to Daniel chapter 8. So go to Daniel chapter 8 and what's the increase of knowledge that God is going to give us on the stone kingdom in Daniel chapter 8. Again, Adventist bread and butter. You've got the you've got the 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 You've got Daniel, Daniel 8 lays out these kingdoms of Bible prophecy and how they interact and, and, and um, 
that line of prophecy and then what's the next thing it's going to tell us? What happened? Which is the? Cleansing of the sanctuary. What does that truth tell us? 8.14. The scripture which above all others is both the central foundation and central pillar of the Adventist faith is the declaration that unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What is the foundation and central pillar of our faith? Daniel 8.14. The cleansing of the sanctuary. We have a high priest in heaven who is in touch with our infirmities, whoever liveth to make his intercession for us, he has a way to clean up our records in heaven to make us good citizens of the stone kingdom. He lays out for us the solution. Here's the problem. But God has a solution for us to become a part of the stone kingdom. When you think of this stone... What, what, how do you picture it in your mind? If you were to illustrate it, how would you picture it? How, how, would, how do Adventists typically illustrate it? You know, if you went to a Daniel and Revelation seminar, what do you see? They, they put up the picture of this and they have a modern interpretation, then they'd show the stone. And what does it look like? Jesus' is second coming, which is fundamentally wrong because it says in the days of these kings, God sets up his kingdom. And he doesn't come with his kingdom, he comes to get his kingdom. Um, But usually you see a burning, fiery meteor. Is that the way you've seen it before? This ugly mass of molten rock, fire coming out of it, coming down to smash the image. But it's a stone and it's without blemish. What kind of a stone is it? What's harder than iron? What stone is harder that, that could crush iron? A diamond. This is flawless. This is beautiful. And it is the hardest mineral. It's so, those um, atoms or whatever the technical words are that, that bond together are the tightest thing on this earth that makes up a diamond. And this is this stone we have to start picturing differently. It's a beautiful rock. Don't we say that? I mean, you know, somebody has a huge wedding ring you go wow look at the rock on her hand (laughs) it's a rock it's a stone but it's flawless it's beautiful (coughs) diamonds rate 10 out of 10 on the Mohs scale of mineral hardness okay so this stone is um, cut out of a mountain without hands and it hits the the image where on the feet So just keep that in mind. It just doesn't hit it anywhere. If you actually wanted to really destroy something, you wouldn't hit the feet. You know, if a policeman is trained to kill, they don't don't aim for the feet. (laughs) You know, you you aim for a vital part. But this this hits the feet and there's a reason for that. Because what we want to do is now go to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11 gives us the purpose or the job function of the king of the north. So what are we going to learn about the stone? from Daniel chapter 11. Its purpose, its job function. Where do you think we'll find that in Daniel chapter 11? If If you're looking at Daniel chapter 11, have you got any idea of where we would find the job function of the stone? Where do we even see the work of God's kingdom in this prophecy. Thank you, yes. Daniel 11 verse 44 says, But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. So who's giving these tidings? This stone kingdom. And what are the tidings? The present truth. Um, Brother James talked about it yesterday. We give it a name. What, what's our purpose? What are we raised for? What message? The three angels' messages. The everlasting gospel are the tidings that come out of the east and north. That tr- You'd be troubled too if this big diamond was going to hit you on the feet as well. It's these messages 
that bring down this image. Now this stone is cut out of the mountain without hands. And then if we actually go back to Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, if you look at verse um, 34, the stone is cut out without hands, it smites the image, breaks them in pieces, and then what happens to the iron, the clay, the brass and the silver? They become like chaff. So here we're going to see a change of symbolism. So when does something become like chaff? What's the process that would bring chaff about? The threshing, harvest time. So if you've got harvest and you've threshed something where you're left with chaff, what else are you left, left with? Wheat. wheat. So the, you've got chaff and you've got wheat. We've got no mention of the wheat here in verse 35. Where is the wheat gone? Then you have to go to verse 44. And in, those, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. It shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold. The go um, oh, I'm sorry, that's not the verse I wanted. Verse 35, my bad. Go back to verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became what? A great mountain that filled the whole earth. So the stone is cut out of a mountain, hits the image and then becomes a, a great mountain. How does it become a great mountain? Because it hits the fit, fit, image at the feet and the feet are then divided into wheat and chaff. Where does the wheat go? The to the great mountain. Mm -hmm. Does everybody follow that? Yeah. Chaff's gone. Chaff's gone, but this stone gets divided. The trick is understanding where the symbolism has changed. It's gone from all these rocks and minerals and this image to uh, the par a parable of agriculture. And so this gets threshed. The bad go with the chaff, the good go with the, the wheat and become the, the great mountain. And what does the work, what, who, who brings about this harvest? The stone kingdom. Because what is the stone kingdom according to Daniel chapter 2? A king and a kingdom. kingdom. So this whole idea that um, Laodicean Adventism teaches that Daniel 2 is Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Rome breaks out into the countries of Europe and then Jesus comes. It just does away with, it, it creates Laodiceanism. It gives us no purpose. It tells us where, doesn't tell us where we are in history. And um, it, it just leaves all the work up to Christ. Did Babylon, did Nebuchadnezzar, himself conquer Medo Persia? What did he have? An army. He was the greatest military leader, but he didn't do it personally. Did Cyrus build the the you know divert the river? No, he directed his people to do that. So, you know, the, every one of these leaders had to have people that followed orders, that believed in the in the furtherance of the kingdom, <laughs> you know, they were on board and they followed their leader without question. And this is what this stone is. It's, it's Christ and his kingdom, the greatest military leader there ever is, who is directing his people to give the tidings to the image that will produce the great mountain. So are those the... Um seeds that you're referencing to in Daniel 35? Daniel verse 43? Daniel 2, 43. So where you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, 
So we talked about that yesterday as being a combination of church craft and state craft, Sister White tells us. Um, and then verse 44 says, in the days of these kings. So we get, we have a transference from an, uh, just a situation where there's only iron and clay to where we've got iron, clay and, verse 41 actually gives us the clue. Yeah, I've got Acts 2, 6, 62 on oh. the second part where it says, they shall number themselves with the seeds of men, but they shall not clue one to another. So even if you go back to the breakup of Europe, you had your church and you had your state. So they worked together, they were in bed together, but they didn't really cleave to one another. The, ch the church used the, and I mean, this, pro this shows how much they actually didn't cleave to one another because the state actually broke away from the church. But um, uh, I guess um, it's... Um, a marriage of convenience, if I can put it that way. Uh, that, that's my. Has anybody else got any thoughts on that verse? So yesterday we looked into miry, which is mud, which is worldliness. So you've got a worldly church. <coughs> when it loses the power of God, it needs the power of the state to do its bidding. So it's done that, it gets the power of the state, but even there, even though they're using each other, it's not a real cleaving. There's no great love. It's, um, yes, it's a marriage of convenience and it, I guess it's typical of, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of, um, we were talking about that this morning. Um, Paez is not here. We were talking about that this morning and I can't think of the word we used. But it, it's, um, when, the, I'll, when the word comes to me. <laughs> it's not that, it's not, it, 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 they work together but it, it's, um, yeah, it's not that stable a relationship. Even though, I mean, that lasted, it didn't quite last 1260 years but they were, you know, Clovis had no great love of Catholicism. It just served his purpose. And so, you know, he was, he, he's just struggling to keep his kingdom. So he puts his army on the side of the papacy. The papacy doesn't like Clovis. Does the Pope like capitalism? No, but it was willing to use Ronald Reagan to bring down the Soviet Union. But then it ha had, you know, if that had a worked out as he wanted, he would have then brought down the glorious land straight away. Didn't happen. So we think they're in love with each other, but they're not really. I don't know how that... I know Herod and Jezebel would have been at marriage of convenience. Um, the historical report is that Herod and Herodias were really in love, so I don't know how that works. <laughs> and she stayed with him till the end, um, even when he got sick. So um, maybe there's... With that, maybe in that story it's telling us that some do are fully on board and others aren't. Uh, Brother James, time? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. All right, well, we might stop there because I want to investigate more about these tidings and how the tidings bring down the image, what these tidings are. We know that the three angels' messages, but uh, there's more that we can glean, glean from that symbolism. So we've seen that the book of Daniel is built upon the um, understanding of repeat and enlarge. We lay these things next to each other and we get more information. But God is out, uh, lays out the problem and then he gives us the solution. But he spends a lot more time lying, laying out and explaining the problem than he does the solution. If we want to understand the cleansing of the sanctuary, you don't go to Daniel it, he tells us that the sanctuary will be clean, cleansed, but then you've got to go to a lot of other places in the Bible to build that, build that doctrine. And so, you know, people say, oh, we don't want prophecy, you know, we only want to hear about Jesus. This is the story, this is the contest that is before us that we read about in our quote. We need to understand the true context, context because why did the king of the north come against God's people? Because were they behaving according to this? 
that they had, did they understand the, the function of the sanctuary? No, they were living their lives like pagans and ignoring the true message that the sanctuary, you know, they gave lip service to it. Uh, you know, they brought their animals, but behind the scenes they were worshipping the works of their own hands and they had their idols. So, yes, and so that's why the king of the north comes. And who, who are we waiting for? We're waiting, we're watching the king of the north now. We're watching him battle. But we know he's getting closer to bring judgment to who? Us. Because God's people have got to be cleaned up so that they can give this message in its purity so that they can be that stone kingdom unified on truth and on doctrine. And, uh, and, and it's that unification that brings about the love and the empathy uh, that binds us together as human beings as well. It's not just about doctrine. That doctrine has a purpose. That doctrine is what is going to change our hearts and minds. And that's why we see the message at the moment, those that are following the message closely, the message is dealing with things like racism and misogynism and xenophobia and all these things that are still in God's people that need to be cleaned up so that we can be this stone kingdom or we'd never be unified. So, um, you know, they're, they're all very relevant. And we'll leave it there for now. So if you'd like to um, join, oh, I should have asked, is there any further questions on what we've touched so far? I just have a, a thing concerning this one. So God is going to take, so we believe that we are the remnant, the seventh year Adventist. So God is going to take the seventh day Adventist to claim the tidings and he ends his message. The so um, we looked at Babylon and Jerusalem. Babylon is built on confusion. Jerusalem is built on peace. Remember, Jerusalem is the city of peace. Um, the Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the what? The outcasts of Israel. So this stone represents a gathering of who? Outcasts. But what is this mountain? It's a kingdom, and it and but it, it it professes to be God's kingdom. But out of God's kingdom, He brings out a a remnant. The remnant do the work. He heals up the broken in heart and binds up their wounds. How? That's how. Through through an understanding of the work of our High Priest and His ministry for us, and and. This, this message, this message is a healing message. It heals us and then, and then we use it. It has a twofold work. Okay, so this, this, ima- this stone has come out of this mountain. Then what happens to this mountain? What happens to this image? It goes to chaff. So what happens to this mountain? It gets blown away with the chaff as well. And then you're left with the great mountain. So this, we're going to see that the tidings, they create us, but they also give us our purpose. They're, what, they're, our, they're our tool, they're our, they're our job function. It's, it's what we're raised to do is to give these messages that will perform this, that will call these people out of Babylon, Mystery Babylon. The thing is there are... There are Entities at work to stop us doing that, to deceive us. Je- Jesus said, when is this, uh, the disciples asked, when is this going to happen? And Jesus said what? Take care no man deceive you because they're going to come in my name, they're going to call themselves what? Christians. That's our first port of call is understanding how apostate Christianity is going to keep us from belonging to this kingdom. We watched the video uh, on the presentation by Carpenter that talked about the stone being cut out without hands and that the Adventist church is a a kingdom of the mountain. The original mountain. Mm -hmm. And we blown away with the chaff. Yeah, I just, I don't know. uh, I experienced this morning in the conversation about the fact that I need to learn, unlearn a lot of things that I learned that are misunderstandings. And that's the purpose, and that's what God is doing as he brings us out to, 
to a full understanding of, of being part of that stone. That yeah, think, think of this as Goliath. And what is the stone? Those five little stones, those five virgins in the hand of David, in the hand of Christ. It's going to bring down that image. With the tidings we have the second end of mystery, which also actually says that uh, Babylon the Great has fallen, which represents the kingdom of and the devil, which is like all that kingdom that we are expecting on top of that. So it makes more sense that we exist. So we'll look at that too, because when was the second angel's message given? When did Babylon fall? So that's already happened in history. We should have seen people coming out and starting to make a mountain in the days of these kings mm -hmm. so it, it's a process that we're, we're actually living in now we make the choice of whether we want it this isn't future this is present truth it's been going on for a, for a while so when is jerusalem builded when babylon falls but we understanding that the falling is a process and the building is a process but let's close with prayer Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we have an high priest. We thank you, Lord, for our king, for our prophet, for our priest, Lord. And we ask that you would fit us up to be a part of this remnant church that will do a great work. We ask that these messages will do their work in us, that we will eat them and love them and um, that we would uh, eat the book of Daniel as you commanded us to do. We thank you for it. We want to be the Daniels at the end of the world. That, that, um, that are beloved. And so we just pray that um, you would be with, the, um, with us as we continue through the day, be with the next speaker, be with the children and all those that are still coming. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.